Okay, let's get going. I had some sort of echo, but I think I defeated it with the headphones. So I hope it disappeared. Um, so what's, what I understood organizers asked me to talk about is about uh, formal developments in theoretical cosmology. So I tried to make the talk uh, uh, more accessible. So it's going to be a sort of a review, not a review of the whole field, just a review of the things that I understand or I think that I understand. So, so here is the outline. We'll start with some motivation, why caring about this uh, formal developments. Then I'll talk a bit about uh, review, what is inflation and the, the sitter space um, as a simplest model for cosmology. And then we'll discuss uh, three distinct topics, uh, analytic techniques for computing cosmological correlators, um, infrared divergences uh, in inflation and the space, and then we'll talk about some non-perturbative gravitational effects. So here I put as a reference uh, this uh, snow mass white paper that we wrote um, with some other people, not that it's the best uh, review ever, but it has at least a more detailed list of references that I'll, I'll provide in the topic. Okay, motivation. Um, so for theories, I mean, theories, they, ju they just like theories. So for them, this section is not uh, very relevant uh, for people who um, uh, care more about observable things. Why uh, should they care at all about the spirit theoretical developments? So let me try to motivate. Uh, we know that our current theory, which is a standard model, our current fundamental theory, standard model of particle physics and uh, lambda CDM cosmology, which includes general relativity, of course, uh, is not complete, both theoretically, because we do not have a UV completion of the gravitational part, uh, and experimentally, for example, uh, uh, we know that there is dark matter and uh, we do not know what it is. So, but we do not know uh, exactly where and when uh, new physics that is beyond new physics, I call it beyond standard model uh, plus under CDM will uh, show up. Okay, so unfortunately now there are no experiments that are guaranteed to see uh, any signs of uh, new physics. Uh, well, I think last uh, such experiments on the particle physics uh, front, that was the discovery of Higgs boson, right? That's what we were, uh, theory was uh, theory developed what, 50 years prior to that, uh, was more or less uh, guaranteeing us that we will see something at OHC. We didn't know exactly at which energy, and then we saw it in 10 years ago. Uh, on the uh, side of astrophysical observation, that was, I would say, gravitational waves, uh, uh, that uh, they were theory for them was developed 100 years ago. So we don't even uh, sort of uh, sometimes think of it as new fundamental uh, physics, but in fact, okay, 100 years ago, that was the front line of theoretical development. And that is kind of how long it takes um, uh, to see uh, this sort of uh, uh, fundamental new physics and experiments. But um, it doesn't mean that uh, we will not see anything, right? Uh, we may hope for a surprise. For example, primordial long Gaussianities can show up, um, tensor modes, a fraction of dark matter can be not a cold dark matter, but something else, like the light relics, uh, equation of state for the dark energy, could not be exactly cosmological constant. All sorts of things uh, may show up, and that's why uh, it's uh, very interesting to keep looking for them observationally. And a nice example of such a surprise was the discovery of positive cosmological constant in 1998. And in fact, one could argue that it was uh, sort of predicted theoretically by uh, Steven Weinberg, at least by order of magnitude, uh, but uh, we should admit uh, here that Weinberg's prediction that was based on anthropic principle was by far not as robust as this theoretical prediction that I was mentioning above. And this is partially because we don't really have a theory uh, for um, fundamental enough theory for cosmology so that we can talk about things like Weinberg's prediction based on anthropic principle, if it's a real thing or not. So it's a bit of guesswork evolved exactly because of our theory is not complete. Okay, so now uh, uh, let me make uh, the following um, uh, sort of uh, put the following perspective that, that I at least have. That I think situation in theory on the cosmological uh, frontier is uh, sort of similar. So we have a standard model and here I held inflation because inflation is not something yet 
experimentally confirmed, uh, I would say um, it's still a conjecture, uh, but it's definitely dominant, dominant conjecture, dominant hypothesis. So it works extremely well. It works uh, on the, the theoretical point of view as an effective theory. I'll explain what it means in more details. Uh, and it explains all the observations that we have currently. Uh, but uh, unlike for standard model general relativity, for inflation, our understanding of allowed parameters of the theory are not um, as good. And one may hope that they exist purely theoretical principles, self-consistency principles of theory of inflation uh, that contain the models that are actually allowed in such a way uh, that uh, these constraints will, uh, you know, suggest uh, some uh, observational prediction. Okay, for what, what I have in mind is something, uh, so just to make this, so is it, one could write an effective theory of inflation that leads to no observations uh, in, in any new future. However, maybe what I'm trying to say here, maybe there are some deeper principles that prohibit such theories. And, and something what we can envision is uh, maybe there is some bound on the number of e folding in terms of uh, Hubble of inflation in the universe of Planck, uh, or some floral parameters constraints in some way, or there is a minimal size of non Gaussianity that should be there for some reason that uh, that we do not yet understand. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that's why I'm saying that there is no guarantee that this is true, but we just do not understand theory well enough to also claim with certainty that this is false, right? And that it's definitely uh, motivates us uh, to study with the hope that uh, actually a fundamental theory side that that it leads to some predictions. Maybe we are just not looking, you know, for the uh, for the thing that has to be there due to some deeper theoretical things. So, so far there are no sharp results of this sort, okay? I don't want to um, uh, oversell it in any way. This is just my hope, my, my motivation, why, uh, why I should study, why I study this. Uh, but, uh, you know, there are some themes in some, um, in the last part of the talk, I'll mention some very remote from reality toy model. We see something like this, so that gives us some uh, enthusiasm. Okay, good. But uh, yeah, for now, I would say that uh, okay, it's good for theorists to follow uh, what uh, what what experimentalists uh, can observe, and maybe it's also good for observers to follow you know what sort of theoretical developments uh, were up. That maybe maybe we will uh, once if we produce something that we will be able to uh, communicate with this in the community. Okay, let me review very, very briefly uh, what is inflation in the theater space, focusing on some um, features that are most relevant for my presentation. So inflation is the simplest known way to generate the initial conditions for hot big bang cosmology. Uh, main features of the theory that I want to emphasize. One, there is quasi the theater space time. What does it mean? So the theater uh, space time, it is um, uh, for the purpose of this section, it's a form of a W space time. Say we take uh, flat spatial slices and the scale factor uh, grows exponentially. If it grows exactly exponentially, that's what I call the theater space, if it grows quasi exponentially, that's quasi the theater space. That this H Hubble scale changes with time slowly. Uh, and so this, this H, uh, it says the scale of inflation. And so far, it's not known. If we measured the tensor modes, uh, we would, uh, at least most reasonable models, constrain the scale of inflation, uh, but uh, we have a so yet. Now, a second ingredient, very important, is that it, uh, inflation, there is also a clock field that sometimes uh, you always, uh, well, we refer to as the inflaton. Uh, so the inflaton, its main uh, goal in life is to determine when inflation ends. But also, uh, this uh, guy necessarily breaks the theater isometry a little bit, and it generates uh, scalar perturbations. Scalar perturbations parameterized by this variable uh, zeta. Uh, so let's look at this cartoon. So here we have uh, the theater space time. It is exponentially expanding. That's what I try to draw. So you see, see scale factor goes into the HT. So it's uh, almost the theater space. And then at some point, um, uh, the clock field uh, says, OK, inflation must end. Uh, could be a different physical mechanism why it ends. But it ends for whatever reason. That transitions some power law per W cosmology. And uh, this red line is the reheating surface. So you see reheating surface is a little bit wiggly. That's true due to quantum fluctuations of this uh, clock field. 
that are now parameterized by this variable t, the here of momentum space of a free transform. Um, uh, if we want, and it has some uh, bispectrum, or oh, sorry, has some power spectrum. We didn't get to bispectrum. It has some power spectrum, so two point function. So the leading order is a Gaussian field with some uh, power spectrum that has the form. There is some amplitude. And uh, so there is a, a scale dependence that is very weak. So this one over k cube, that would be what's called the scale invariant uh, power spectrum with three dimensions. But then there is a small field that uh, historically represents something with y minus an s. And that's uh, from experiments. I know that this guy is roughly 10 to minus 10. And, and this uh, um, ns, uh, is, uh, NS, ns is uh, 0.965. Uh, I think the latest measurement from Planck. Um, so now let's see what to, from here, from this formula, can we say something at least about the scale of inflation? So uh, first of all, um, you see the, this, this fluctuations, they depend on uh, the uh, derivative of a Hubble constant. So if it was exactly the theta, that wouldn't make sense. And this combination is dot of h square, that's epsilon, that's uh, one of uh, what's called slow parameters. And it can be, you know, it, generically, it's uh, something also of order of this ns minus one. So it's a few uh, roughly 10 to minus two. Um, uh, but but it doesn't have to be this way. But if we were to take a 10 to minus two and this CS is and speed us down again, if, if it's somewhat of a number, then uh, it gives us some understanding what is the nature of care for inflation. So you see, it can be a very, very high scale, uh, closer to Planck scale. Uh, it has to be below the Planck scale for, for things to be under theoretical control, but can be closer to Planck scale than any other um, experiments that we can uh, perform um, ever. Uh, but uh, there are also models where the scale of inflation is much, much low in principle can be in, um, it can be orders of magnitude low. Good, and the third, uh, a third important feature for my uh, talk is that there are some uh, what's called non gaussianities of this perturbation. So this field that cannot, uh, um, it must have some connected higher point functions. Okay, so both three point function and four point function. So it cannot be an exact Gaussian field. Uh, however, uh, just from effective uh, field theory point of view, um, uh, the, from our low energy description, okay, effective field theory is a, so it's effective description that's true at low energies, but does not have to um, uh, to hold it uh, all the way to n Planck, uh, for example. Uh, but just from this effective theory point of view, it can be very small and, and not observable. Uh, nevertheless, a large part of my talk will focus on uh, some sort of interaction of uh, field uh, during inflation and attempt to understand better these non-Gaussian features. So uh, there are just two main uh, approaches, theoretical approaches to inflation. One is you write some explicit model. For example, you design your clock as some scalar field that's rolling down the potential. Here the potential is very flat, so it's rolling very slowly. So we have this quasi elicit revolution. Then when it comes here on this picture, that's when it drops down, uh, reheating happens. Or you can just say you have some effective field theory. That's where you try it like runs and basically directly for this uh, fluctuations because they always measure fluctuations. We do not know what is this uh, more UV microscopic description. Maybe it's not some scalar field, some complicated composite thing that produces this clock, some string brain winding around another string brain, whatever. Uh, and then we just try the effective field theory, some rules how to uh, parameterize. Um, this fluctuation, there is some kinetic term, and then say there is this term, uh, you know, that, that I put roughly, that will produce for us some three-point function. And that was in this uh, famous paper, uh, spelled out the rules for how to write this effective Lagrangian. Um, now, effective field theory approach is more general. However, it, it likely includes theories that are not consistent. There are things like ghost inflation, for example, that you can write as an effective field theory, but the gut feeling is that this thing shouldn't exist. And basically, I'm going that what we're trying to improve our theoretical understanding to uh, put uh, a more stringent rules uh, on, on writing down this sort of Lagrangians for effective theory. 
And note that this potential, uh, some more fixable with potential, is also it's just a partial UV completion because most of these potentials they lead to non renormalizable theories. Uh, so um, it, it doesn't um, uh, doesn't win you much. Okay. Uh, now, two important topics of ongoing research that I'm not going to discuss, but still, I just want to mention that they exist. Uh, and again, in in this review paper, you you'll find better references. It's embedding of inflation in uh, string theory. So uh, one approach to this: okay, we're not happy with some explicit potentials, partially completion. Let's write some string theoretic model uh, that produces some effective potential, you know, of this sort. Uh, or leads to some effective theory of this sort and produces product inflation. And uh, this is uh, where, you know, there are two groups of people, basically, uh, some of them are uh, constructing this, um, uh, these models, others uh, trying to prove that uh, in string theory, it's impossible. Uh, if you put uh, somehow these uh, two groups of people uh, in the same room, they will start uh, screaming at each other and eventually fighting. So uh, it's, uh, it's a very interesting um, uh, field to follow, but okay, somehow I, I think there is no um, uh, no absolutely robust construction of inflation string theory. Moreover, even if you construct something in perturbative uh, string theory, uh, it's it's still not, it's a very good indication that, that something is uh, really exists, but but it's not a guarantee. Uh, and, and another uh, important field of study is like genericity of initial conditions for inflation. Because uh, here, let's say, I say, okay, I put my field on top of its potential. Uh, okay, maybe this never happens. Maybe this is very non generic. And what uh, uh, what the um, uh, uh, people like Leonard Senator and collaborators uh, showed is that, um, at least in classical, but in strongly coupled uh, gravitational regime, it is uh, enough to have. Like a small patch where he'll take this value, and then uh, there will always be a region that uh, Okay, uh, just to summarize, um, we have inflationary cosmology thing we really want to understand, but it's a little bit too hard for theorists uh, so far. So we do some simplification. There are different levels of simplifications, um, just quantum field theory on rigid behavior space. Uh, when gravity is turned off, uh, something I'm going to discuss later in the talk. Then we can do perturbation theory around the heater state, where perturbatively include uh, gravitational correction. That includes uh, slow roll inflation with this uh, potentials uh, theory. Then uh, we can have quantum field theory on the heater with strongly broken, uh, sorry, not on the heater, uh, quantum field theory where the space time has the heater form, but the uh, field theory interactions, they break strongly the heater isometry. Now, these are more general theories of inflation, again, uh, encompassed by this effective uh, field theory approach. Um, and then also there is uh, like a, 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 some ultimate level of simplification where we consider some toy models. Maybe we even go to lower dimensions very often. However, this allows us to control some non-perturbative gravitational effects that potentially may be very interesting and important. I'll talk about it in the last part of my talk. Okay, good. Uh, here's my outline again. We go to the next topic, analytic techniques for cosmological correlators. Uh, talk about a little bit of booster and unitaries. Uh, so uh, the goal here is uh, to calculate higher point statistics of primordial perturbations uh, of uh, you know, this uh, clock field, maybe some other fields uh, to have them in the game, on the reheating surface. And uh, really, the reheating surface here, I think of it as the future asymptotic boundary of the Cedar space. OK, it's a good model to, uh, to have in mind. Uh, there are two approaches, both inspired by corresponding developments uh, in um, in flat space and in anti deceitful space, which is um, uh, a solution of Einstein equations with negative cosmological constant. Okay, so it's some sort of uh, negatively curved, uh, maximally symmetric cousin of the deceitful space that that we talked about in inflation. Now, a uh, little diagram to kind of explain what's going on. Uh, so, uh, as I said, there are two, two approaches. Uh, one of them is called cosmological bootstrap. Um, and uh, the avatar of this approach in, uh, in ideas or in flat space is uh, amplitudes, um, field called uh, amplitudes. And the idea here is to calculate on shell observables. On shell, in sense of cosmology, in cosmological context, that means pushed. 
to receive the surface right away, not uh, at some early times, but at, at, at late times of future infinity, by understanding singularities and various building blocks of uh, perturbative uh, diagrams. Okay, We're not trying to compute diagrams uh, appearing in perturbation theory directly, but um, uh, fix them in some way by, by singularity. Okay, uh, and uh, then uh, there is uh, uh, another uh, approach that uh, uh, doesn't uh, really have a name, uh, but uh, uh, this approach is actually inspired by what uh, in, in the flat space um, or in ideas called uh, bootstrap. So maybe we can call this approach amplitudes and then it will be completely confusing for uh, people from outside. But anyway, so what this, this bootstrap in, in the way it's used uh, for conformal theories and other particular space or for, uh, for S matrix bootstrap and flat space, uh, it is uh, calculating or often it's uh, placing some very stringent bounds, again, on non shell observables using non perturbative physical principles that are, should be valid in the ultraviolet. There should be so general principles of unitarity um, to constrain the low energy uh, infrared field. Okay, I will. Uh, uh, so cosmological bootstrap, this uh, this thing, uh, was uh, discussed uh, last year uh, by uh, Guy uh, Pimentel, uh, uh, and I think there are several talks this year, so, so I will not talk about it in any details. Uh, just mention that recent developments, uh, they um, were um, focusing in particular on a strong breaking of the heat isometries. Uh, again, there is this normal paper that uh, you can uh, look for better references and also just a couple of papers that I uh, noticed and, and brought up. Uh, but uh, let me talk uh, instead about this uh, second approach. By the way, it's not the, the boundary between these two approaches. It's not uh, super sharp, of course. Okay, it uh, can be, um, it, it can be smeared. So, okay, uh, for this uh, non perturbative analytic techniques. Uh, so, so far, they uh, were developed mostly with uh, the theta isometers. We didn't generalize the, uh, for this uh, case of broken DS isometers, so that, that should and uh, can be done. So, uh, first, uh, we made some progress in understanding what, unit what, what is an imprint of unitarity of. Um, uh, evolution, cosmological evolution, uh, leaves uh, on uh, this uh, correlate, cosmological correlation function. So uh, using conformal partial wave expansion that I will explain a, a little bit what this is in a second, uh, we can transform uh, an abstract notion of positivity of cosmological measure into um, some uh, concrete equation of correlators. What I mean, so let's take a four point function of some uh, scalar field that lives in our uh, the heater space. I'm proxy for an for an inflaton, uh, although it's not exactly the inflaton because now I have exactly the remarks. Remember, for inflaton we need some breaking. Of this. <laughs> Nevertheless, so I can think of this four point function as an overlap of two states. So you see, I, I now think quantum mechanically a little bit. So I have um, uh, so here I have like a bra of my wave function, or what is it? No, this is the bra, right? The bra of my wave function. So here time goes in this direction. You see this like this inter unit, that repeating surface. And here I have a cap of my wave function. So I compute the relation function, I mean I sandwich my field between bra and the cap. But uh, the idea here is that the two first two fields are associated with the with the bra state, the second two fields are associated with the cat state. So I get some overlap, and then because of the positivity of norm and the Hilbert space, um, uh, I, I, I get some sort of positive definite uh, object, but it's now very abstract because this uh, field, you know, they're in different uh, space time locations. It's some complicated infinite dimensional matrix. What, what, how do we get any mileage from the fact that it's positive? And we do the following. Uh, we do uh, a, a conformal partial wave decomposition. Uh, what it is, we take our four point function and integrate it over all four variables uh, with, some uh, uh, known function uh, that uh, is called conform partial weight. So um, I'm not going to say what it is uh, in detail. I'll just say that it is basically a generalization of spherical harmonics, YLM, that I think you're all familiar about. So YLM 
uh, these are like conform partial waves for uh, SO3 uh, group. And uh, here we have the full the Cedar symmetry group, which is SO1 4. So there is some fancier version of YLMs called conform partial waves. So importantly, they depend uh, on the spin, this J spin, it's like L spin, uh, and the spectral parameter that they continuous uh, values from um, zero to infinity. Good, so we can take any four point function that is uh, the Cedar invariant and convolute it with this variable, uh, sorry, with this uh, partial waves, with this uh, fancy Fourier harmonics. Uh, and uh, we'll get this set of spectral densities labeled by spin and this continuous variable. And this, uh, we call them um, uh, spectral density, okay? Um, they have uh, there some uh, interesting uh, objects, that is my claim. So um, here I draw, I drew uh, schematically like uh, singularity structure of this rho j of nu. So in many cases, this appears to be a meromorphic function and it po it's poles, they uncode some interesting physics. For example, if we have some uh, heavy resonance uh, that interacts with our inflaton, so we have, uh, you know, our say inflaton and then there is some heavy resonance that was produced in this and that generates some four-point function. That leads uh, to poles in the spectral density that are close uh, to this uh, real line of nu, which on this plot goes in uh, three halves uh, plus uh, i nu. So there's three halves, little d is, is three number of special dimensions. So there will be some poles, sort of like resonance, like we see resonances uh, on, on collider experiments. Uh, this is a way to represent cosmological correlators so that heavy particles, they feel like some resonance because they are unstable, they have some width, some small width, if it's perturbative. But anyway, but what I wanted to say um, about unitarity, so there is a lot to be said about this Rho J of Nu. If you, if you look at our paper, with Kamatsu and Dipieta, then uh, we talk a lot about properties of this function. But here I just want to highlight that unitarity is just a positivity of this uh, Rho J of Nu. So it must be, if there's some function with this Fourier transform, you must get something positive, okay? Now, another idea, the idea of uh, uh, what, uh, what the bo really bootstrap idea, the analog of, of what was done for bootstrap uh, in flat space and for conformal theories that was um, initiated in this paper is that you can do this conform partial wave expansion by grouping your field in different ways. You can take one, two, and then, and then kind of decompose this way uh, times this, or you can take, uh, you know, Phi one three together and decomposing this. You should get the same answer. This correlation functions do not care how you order them, but you get uh, two different decompositions. And because they should be equal, and because there's some positivity constraints in both channels, you can get uh, some very interesting constraints. And in fact, so in cosmology, it has only been uh, very preliminarily worked out. But if it was um, in this field of conformal bootstrap, this equation applied to, uh, say, uh, Ising model, critical Ising model in three dimension. This equation actually delivers the most precise uh, determination of Ising critical exponents. Okay, better than any Monte Carlo simulations, better than any other analytic or numerical techniques. Uh, this equation can be really, really powerful. And it was by, if you look in this review, by, by these people, uh, it was uh, mastered to perfection uh, in the context of uh, uh, conformal field theories and now more in the context of S matrix. And, and we want to initiate this study in the context of cosmological correlation. So uh, a little to-do list. So first, I think we're close to putting uh, some bounds on uh, in the decitron variant case on say D5 to the four operators. There is a classic result that in flat space, the coupling of this um, um, for derivative operator for a scalar field, for a light scalar field should be positive. In the theater, I think uh, there is so far no results, but, but I think we're closing to, uh, close to saying if there are any bounds on operator so, And then we want to incorporate a break on these isometers and start putting some bounds on operators appearing in the um, effective theory of inflation. I, I mentioned uh, this paper over here that uh, that a few years ago also um, 
discuss how this can be done. That's an interesting paper. Good, good. Uh, let me move to uh, okay to infrared divergences, uh, the next topic. So uh, again, uh, why uh, why care about infrared divergence? Well, there were claims in the literature that uh, there are problem problems with uh, field theories uh, uh, in the theater space, uh, and if these problems were really severe, that could say that you know this theory of inflation that we are using as our main candidate uh, is actually not consistent. Okay, and that would be uh, really bad. Uh, but the punchline, I just was the punchline. There are no problems or surprises in quantum fields on the theater space or in inflation away from eternal inflation regime. I'll explain in a second what is eternal inflation regime, but it's not something that we need to worry about for the moment in some realistic inflationary models, uh, there are no problems. Now, why expect a problem? Uh, let's consider first, uh, again, a light scalar field on rigid the theater space, forget gravity, we take some Lagrangian for a scalar field on rigid the theater space, just interfere with some potential, uh, that's why the theater metric, uh, turn of gravity, Hubble uh, keeps constant. Let's take lambda phi to the four three with some mass term, take mass much smaller than Hubble, coupling constant small. Okay, just uh, to get going. Let's attempt the perturbative calculation of power spectrum um, in um, uh, this model. Okay, again, this is my repeating surface, time goes upward. This first just a free two point function. Then there is some loop, two loops, blah, blah, blah. If you estimate how these diagrams go, uh, this goes to phase one, we normalize this to the one, this goes lambda went to the four, lambda squared to the end of the eight. We see if mass is small enough, if mass uh, is uh, m squared smaller than Hubble squared lambda, there is Hubble to make it all dimensional, okay? Um, lambda to the one half then what happens is that perturbation theory badly breaks down okay that's what i write here so it doesn't mean that there is a physical problem it means that method of calculation method of doing perturbative calculations is bad and with Leonardo, uh, we carefully developed the formalism, uh, uh, such formalism, okay, formalism uh, that uh, solves this problem, that replaces the uh, perturbation theory, and, uh, although the idea was sort of known since early work of Stravinsky. We just made it careful to make sure that there is really no problem. So uh, very, it's it's a bit technical formalism. You can look in the paper. You can ask me if you have questions. Um, I may be able to explain uh, something, but uh, very roughly the idea. So define the long field. Uh, long field means a collection of long modes in position space. Okay, in the following way. So phi i, let's pick some position x i, uh, and then we take Fourier modes only up to some scale lambda of t that changes with time. Okay. But it's very, very super horizon about super horizon by the fraction of the epsilon. And epsilon we take small, but not arbitrarily small. We do not want to take it smaller than this exponential of minus one of this one. Then we define this uh, of this PN, which has sort of probability distributions that generate the correlation functions of our field phi. Okay, so here everything depends on time, but in this definition, X is kept T. But although lambda depends on time here and, and indicate and the full correlation functions okay the correlation functions of these long modes that are captured by the probability plus short modes that are perturbed so now for this pn we can derive a system of uh, linear partial differential equations so it's a hierarchy of differential equation because there is principle infinitely many of these pns so we define this um, Differential operators with respect to fields, okay. Uh, some partial derivatives with respect to these fields, uh, long fields at, at uh, various spatial locations, uh, and on time they depend. So we derive a, a hierarchy of uh, partial differential equations that uh, um, evolve the distributions in time. And um, okay, you see there are some the red they highlighted the leading terms. 
So at leading order, these equations, they decouple, they separate, and then there are some sub-leading corrections that, okay, they correspond to some subtle effects at long moles, they're long, but they do not have exactly zero momentum. So a few long moles, they come, come together, make short moles. That introduces some mixing terms between these partial differential equations, but they are sub-leading. So you can consistently first find, say you want to find P1, the one point probability distribution, you find it to leading order, then you go to P2, then you find P2, then you substitute it here, and you find P1 with better precision. And in principle, you go to any precision, you never encounter any infragilities. Okay, no need to evaluate Feynman diagrams for long moles. Good, so that uh, settles the issue with the uh, gravity techniques. Uh, now, uh, sorry, this settles the issue with quantum field theory, but uh, now gravity can be incorporated in this framework, for example, in this paper, uh, was explained what to do. We add the simpleton perturbation to our PNs. Now, PN depends on the inflaton uh, perturbation and then maybe some other field present during inflation. Uh, there is a bit more complicated by, again, you can derive partial differential equation. The difference is that there is no potential for zeta, for my variable that is just to parameterize inflation perturbation. So it never reaches a stationary solution. For example, in this set of two fields, uh, the, there is uh, the, roughly the solution looks the following. So there is some distribution that is stationary for the extra field. Okay, V of 5 is a potential. And then uh, the distribution for the inflaton uh, perturbations, they keep evolving with time. So it gets broader with time. That is some um, Gaussian distribution in order, but it gets broader with time. Uh, but there is a bound on the length of inflation before it goes into this eternal regime, as explained in this paper, so that everything is consistent. It never becomes too broad. You still never run out of uh, validity of this equation. Okay, now this eternal inflation that I keep mentioning. Oops, you want to erase anyway. The eternal inflation um, uh, is uh, when uh, the slow roll parameter becomes very small. This epsilon gate is defined. Uh, so the delta rho over rho becomes the one, and that basically uh, leads to this effect that globally universe never repeats. There's always some part of the universe that continues inflating. So that's a complicated tradition. Could be that our universe is, is like this on very large scales, and we need to learn how to make sense of it. But, but it's not a, a problem that you encounter in some um, the inflationary models that we write down to explain the absurd part of our, of, uh, of of the sky, okay, and the single fluctuation. So the problem of infrared divergences is uh, solved in a sense that it is inexistent. It's not uh, something that uh, precludes us to proceed. Okay, um, I'm running out of time. I should maybe speak even faster, uh, but uh, uh, probably everyone will watch it on some sort of time forward and 1.5 speed anyway. Uh, good, so non-perturbative gravitational effects, uh, the last uh, uh, last topic. And again, we start with this question, you know, why would we even care about some non-perturbative effect if we said that, okay, perturbative effects are small, uh, no air divergences, everything is fine, why care? Okay, uh, so uh, explain, inflation has this feature that it raises information about initial conditions, at least to some extent. However, a complete theory, uh, the, it must also explain you know, what happened before inflation. And it could be that inflation is preceded by singularity where some uh, gravity becomes really strong and quantum gravity effects become important. Okay, that's kind of one say how this uh, strong additional effect, quantum gravity can creep in our description of the world. But uh, an interesting, uh, the, really the motivation for this, uh, for this work uh, is that recent studies of black hole operation, especially in the framework of ADA 50 correspondence, revealed uh, somewhat unexpectedly that non-perturbative gravitational effects can be dominant and calculable also for infrared observable at the long distances way before curvatures become small. Uh, so this was uh, some really, really exciting set of papers uh, a couple of years ago, and they're continuing some burst of uh, beautiful activity in this um, uh, more formal um, parts of uh, theoretical physics. Uh, by no means I can review, but let me just uh, give you some taste of what it is. 
So here I have the Penrose diagram uh, for a black hole in flat space. Okay, this is a, sorry, the Penrose diagram. It's a conformal map of the space time that preserves causal structure, preserves uh, light, still goes on 45 degrees. Each point here is an S. As an S2, so it's a four dimensional black hole, I draw the two dimensional diagram. Okay, so this interior of a black hole, this thing is a singularity. This is a symptotic uh, infinity. So if we look at a black hole from far away, we see it, uh, we see it somewhere here. And this red thing is a 14 edition. So classically, black holes they exist forever, they have some singularity that's hidden by the horizon. Um, but uh, quantum mechanically, black holes they do something more interesting. They Hawking, they meet this Hawking radiation. Okay. And uh, then uh, what happens is that if you consider some slide, let's say this red slide at the late time, but uh, still before, way before it is singularity. So it's metric, uh, metric perturbations are small and um, everywhere, also curvature is small everywhere on this slide. Uh, what happens is that there is a phenomenon of black hole complementarity. That interior of a black hole, it ceases to be an independent set of degrees of freedom. In fact, it is uh, some rewriting of degrees of freedom that, uh, that live uh, very, very far away. So even though black hole hasn't really evaporated yet, its interior is already some sort of fake thing. And um, so there is a non perturbative gravitational effect. I mean, if you just look at this space time, it's semi classically classical, it doesn't make any sense why that should be happening. But it was recently understood how it's happening. And more sharply, it's formulated in the context of this uh, ADS CFT correspondence that basically tells us that, well, all of this uh, space time is really emergent, that there is some quantum mechanical system. Uh, that has no dynamical metric um, that uh, that lives uh, somewhere far away and it has finitely many degrees of freedom and once you know you caught an of coating radiation just do not have extra degrees of freedom to to accommodate your black hole so you must admit that your black hole is actually you know already contained in the degrees of freedom of this uh, early coating radiation lots of progress and sharpening of this understanding of the black hole complementarity happened in this so now, for cosmology, we do not have an analogous description with emergent uh, space time uh, for various technical uh, complications uh, or maybe conceptual complications. However, there's a spike of recent activity. So, people, some people that you may uh, know, uh, even um, uh, wrote papers uh, recently uh, trying to come up with ideas how we can also describe cosmology, the theater, or in inflation in space time and depends on the context also with a system with some finite number of degrees of freedom okay very very rough summary of what this this ether holography is about now this leads to a puzzle that given classically the volume grows exponentially and we have only finitely many degrees of freedom at our disposal is there some sort of uh, complementarity in cosmology so uh, if we have here the Penrose diagram of uh, global Bethesda space, okay, global, it means that it has uh, geodesically complete space time. This is a contracting part, that's an expanding part. Anyway, our fair W slices, some sort of red lines like this. If we focus on inflation, we focus on this uh, future part. And you see this slice again, Penrose diagram ties it, but we know from the metric that it uh, expands exponentially so it is exponentially large and there is some sort of you know cmb radiation is some sort of analog of talking radiation um, and if there is a notion of uh, complementarity in the uh, space that means that okay maybe not all of these degrees of freedom although classically it looks like it keeps growing the space and maybe some of these degrees of freedom they stop really being independent in the same way as we now sort of certain that it happens in the interior of the black hole Good, good. Some similarities, but also many important differences between these two space time, of course, uh, Schwarzschild and cosmology. Now, if yes, does it uh, manifest itself also as non perturbative gravitational effect? And okay, it's a separate question. Could it also lead to observable consequences? So we don't know the answer yet, but there is some um, very preliminary results and some toy model that we will start with two on uh, in it. Um, is that we can consider some uh, two-dimensional uh, model of inflation, if you like. Okay, so there is the R, is you know, it's the Einstein-Hilbert term, 
and uh, the, the, this guy is uh, called Kilaton, who uh, plays a bit of a role of an infoton in this model. And there is some matter field that really puts, you know, some conformal matter, some radiation, uh, say, say CB radiation in this two-dimensional model. So there's some generic solution that uh, that looks like this either space at late times, okay, two-dimensional, one plus one dimension this is space. And then this inflaton uh, grows with time. We may say when it becomes large enough, then we repeat and we just go directly to flat space. Okay, very simple model of cosmology. What happens, what happens is that if we want to calculate cosmological correlators in this model, well, as we had above, we need to have two copies of this space time, right? Because we want to sandwich our field between the bra and the cat of our cosmological wave function. And here comes uh, an interesting surprise that when the universe is large enough, when inflation lasts long enough, there is actually some sort of space time connection between bra and the cat uh, of the wave function that I draw here that we call bra cat wormhole. So this bracket wormhole is suppressed by this factor e to the minus phi zero, and okay, phi zero that was that was something large um, uh, in for this model to to make sense. So that's why it's a non-perturbative gravitational effect, an avatar of the fact that something on perturbative. However, it gets enhanced by some metric contribution, really dominates the correlation functions when the universe is large enough. And that leads to a funny uh, correction, to an interesting connection. Correction, correction, interesting correction uh, to the power spectrum, okay, in uh, this uh, model uh, that uh, at low k, the power spectrum is not scaling, but it's in, in one special dimension, so scale my power spectrum one over k. Instead, we get one over k squared at long distance. The short distances, we still would get one over k, but at long distance, we get one over k squared. And this the key parameter depends on, on, on the model. So that that's you know, if we live in the two-dimensional world, we would find uh, we would have a chance to observe something interesting, really non-perturbative quantum gravitational effect, crazy connection, space-time connection between Brian and Kettle, the wave function manifests itself uh, just in the power spectrum. Okay. No claims of generalization to higher dimension yet, uh, but uh, this is uh, you know interesting uh, to see if. If something like this could exist, brings me to my conclusion. Sorry, I'm a little bit over time, so I'll I'll, I'll be quick. I mean, you can also stop at this point uh, watching this. So, uh, inflation is the dominant theory for initial conditions, consistent at low energies. So, for the Hubble uh, during inflation, this says, however, we don't yet know how to promote it to a full, non-perturbative, complete theory. As we really only know in some cases, uh, in the simplistic ground, I just see the space through this idea. So this is one of them. Anyway, uh, so that is a flourishing field of uh, study, more open questions than answers. Uh, however, we're making some progress, something we can say with certainty that there are no perturbative infrared uh, instabilities, contrary to some early claims of the literature. Uh, analytic methods for cosmological correlators are being actively developed. Uh, they provide both just practical, efficient computational tools for non gaussianities in this interesting model, but also possibly they will lead to constraints on the, the space of inflationary models that maybe not everything goes and the space is much smaller. And that hope is that the constraints, that they will be uh, tight enough that it will uh, you know, suggest that maybe there is a, also a way to see something. And finally, that there is a more, not much more speculative, but also very exciting opportunities that some non perturbative quantum gravity effects can play uh, an important role. Okay, let me stop here. Yeah. Okay.